I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. When I was young, from age 5 to 12 years old, we lived in the area of the middle of the Olympic National Park. This was in the 70s, and it was common to hear the locals talk of Sasquatch. Very few people questioned the possibility of his existence, and there were tons of stories of encounters in that area. On more than one occasion, we had strange things happen to us in the deep woods of the rainforest, and I would like to share one of those experiences. Our family often spent the weekends camping and found ourselves a very remote place called Salmon Creek, I believe. So there were two or three other families that always went camping with us, and we all got there and had camp set up fairly early in the day. At one point, some of us kids were bored and decided we wanted to walk out to the road we came in on, as there was a cool waterfall in the creek that we wanted to walk back to. So as we're walking along, we all, four or five of us, noticed that it was real quiet in the woods, and it just felt a little bit strange, almost like someone was following us or something. I remember us talking about it. Well, eventually, we just continued on and basically forgot about it. And at one point, there was a dead tree leaning over on one side of the road. So we were like, let's block the road so nobody else comes to our awesome camping spot. So we knocked the skinny little tree over into the road and continued on. We knocked over a few more skinny little dead trees onto the road, just messing around, and kept walking toward the waterfall. We got there. It was more boring than we expected. So we hung out a bit, then headed back to camp about a mile away. As we start back, we notice up ahead a few hundred yards that the road is now literally blocked by trees about every 10 to 15 feet, and quite a bit bigger trees, and many of them were live trees pulled up by the roots. They were way bigger than the skinny dead five or six that we knocked down in the middle of our trek, and there was probably 40 to 50 trees down that we had to step over to get back to camp. At first, we figured our dads followed us and did it just for the heck of it. So we started dragging some of them out of the road until we couldn't move some of them due to the size, so we gave up. We finally got back to camp and all the adults were there, so we mentioned them following us, but my dad and another dad both said they didn't know what we were talking about. So we all decided it must have been some other people camping in the area, although there was nobody around, and when we explained that we only knocked down a few trees, but there were so many more when we came back, they said we will worry about it Sunday when the camping trip is over. So we went about our weekend. Fast forward like three to four hours and us kids are swimming in the creek when a park ranger truck pulls up and two rangers get out. We were kids. I was around nine or ten years old, so thought nothing of it. But I remember we joked they must have moved all those logs to get to the camp. So then our dads and one park ranger came down to the creek and the ranger was pissed said that we ruined living trees and blocked the road so bad they had two guys with chainsaws working over two hours to get through. When we explained ourselves and the oldest boys of the group swore that we were telling the truth, the rangers told us to go play, but stay nearby, and our parents talked with the rangers for a little while and then they left. I remember our parents didn't want any of us far from camp the rest of the day, and when it got dark, we all stayed right in camp. The next morning, we packed up and left, which we all thought was weird since it was only Saturday, and we went to our normal camping spot, a campground called July Creek on Lake Quinault. Now, I know that doesn't seem like a sighting, as we never saw anything that day, but I would bet that was Sasquatch messing with us just for fun. I want to share another crazy part of that night that I had forgotten about. So, all of us younger kids were sleeping in a camper, the type that sat up in the bed of a pickup with the bunk above the cab, Two of the girls were sleeping up there, all of us boys were on the floor and on the other bed, which was the fold-down table, while the other kids were in a tent nearby. Our parents were all out sitting around the campfire, drinking and laughing, enjoying a beautiful night camping. As typical, the girls were randomly giggling and laughing and being preteens, and at one point, all of a sudden, one of them starts screaming, one of the loudest screams I have ever heard. I mean, this girl's scream was ear-piercing, and she was just all freaked the heck out. Immediately, there were parents flying in the door of the camper to see what was happening, and all Lisa could do was scream and shake. She couldn't even talk, but kept pointing at the window. None of us knew what she was freaking out about until she finally calmed down enough to say that she had rolled over and looked out the little side window, and when she pulled the curtain back, there was a huge monkey-looking man staring at her. 
Now, here's the deal. Lisa has a really bad habit of lying and making stuff up just for attention. So the parents didn't really believe her until she just continued on being freaked out to the point she was nearly hysterical. It was pretty obvious that she really seen something or at least was convinced she had seen something. Her mom eventually calmed her down and all the other parents went back out to sit around the campfire a while longer. They all acted like it was really nothing to us kids, but I did notice all the men around the campfire with flashlights and a weapon or two for quite some time that night, which made me curious. I know the parents were set on us getting up early and leaving right away around daylight, which was also kind of unusual. They said it was to get to a good spot at July Creek, but we didn't know. One night many years later while talking with Dad, I mentioned that night, and he said that there was something definitely out there that night, and the men never went to bed the whole night. They sat around the fire all night long. They said they quit drinking any alcohol after Lisa freaked out, so they would be 100% alert just in case it came back or there was more than one out there stalking the camp. He said that when Ron went to the other side of the camper to look for the monkey-looking man, he heard something very big running away fast through the woods. Ron then turned around to where the window of the camper was, and it was at least a foot higher than he could see in, and he was six foot five. So if something was looking in that window, it was around eight feet tall. The only reason the adults decided to stay the night was so us kids wouldn't get any more scared than we already were. Dad said there was weird crap happening all around our camp the whole night, but they never saw anything which made it much scarier. Anytime we ever asked our parents to go camp out there after that night, they would make an excuse of some sort, so we would go to July Creek Campground on Lake Quinault instead. We never camped anywhere primitive like that ever again while we lived in that area. This was just one of the many strange experiences I had growing up in the deep woods of the Pacific Northwest. This occurred in June of 1989. Mrs. Brenda G., washing the dinner dishes, looking out over her backyard past the horse corral with its pony and off into the distance, notices that suddenly the horse becomes unruly and seems close to panic, while an indistinct figure passes through the trees behind the corral. She calls to Nick, Nick, there's some kids out there trying to tease the horse, and steps out of the kitchen back door with a BB gun in her hands for good measure. Nick races out past her in some distance down the overgrown meadow along the stand of trees, where he comes abruptly face to face with a Sasquatch standing on the footpath. Nick comes to such a screeching halt that he slides on moist vegetation and sits down on the ground. For reassurance, he throws a backward look towards his mother, who, however, has returned to the house. When he looks back at the Sasquatch, it's already walking with long strides across the brush and wildflower-covered meadow, lifting up its feet more than people do. As Nick scrambles to get up, a branch snaps and the Sasquatch turns to look at him with big eyes. Nick runs back into the house, tearing the screen door off its hinges in the process to tell his mother about the creature and to change into boots from his slippery loafers. When he charges back out, taking a large army bayonet from over the fireplace for protection, with Brenda close behind, their two dogs have retreated under the house. As he runs down through the same meadow, the Sasquatch is still walking about there, retreats downhill, crosses a small creek and stops on the far bank of the creek under a fir tree to face his pursuers, his entire body bathed in sunlight and visible from head to toe. Nick stops about 30 feet away, his mother stands about 15 feet behind him. This silent tableau holds its place for what seems an extraordinary long time, perhaps five minutes, although Nick's and Brenda's estimates colored by the adrenaline of the encounter, range as high as 20 minutes. Whatever length of time passes, it gives Nick and Brenda the opportunity for detailed inspection of the Sasquatch. They describe it as being six foot six inches tall, as measured against a branch that barely touched the crown of its head, covered with black gray fur and golden brown patches on its shoulders and chest. The hair is four to five inches long and dirty with burrs in it, the head is notable for its pronounced brow ridge and deep-set eyes that are less open than human eyes, facing into the sun. It was a wide and stumpy nose, the hairiness under the nose getting thicker, hiding the jawline. It had impressively wide shoulders. Man, they were wide. Nick holds his hands far apart in retelling. Heavy arms, wide hands with thick fingers, and dark brown and rough palms. 
Its nails have a deep yellow, nicotine-stained color. Its torso narrows somewhat to the waist, no genitals were visible in the fur, and it has sort of a small butt for a man, according to Brenda's astute assessment. Both observers perceive the animal as a male. Neither of them detects any smell. In due time, Brenda gets the willies and anxiously screams to Nick to break it off. Thereupon, the Sasquatch screams, takes a step across the creek toward them while holding its arms out to the side about 45 degrees, as if to herd them on their way. They run halfway up the hill to the house when Nick feels compelled to give it one more look. He's rewarded by a repeat of the faintly aggressive display. They continue to the house, Brenda scooping up John from the lawn, who says, Mummy, there's a big monkey in our backyard. Brenda climbs up on the low garage roof and watches the Sasquatch walk away. The dog stays under the house for safe two hours and will not let themselves be coaxed out, even by having meat waved at them. The horse had substantial abrasions on its fetlocks from having gotten snagged on a rope in its panic. Brenda phones 911 but hangs up before the call is answered. After some time, she phones back and reports the encounter, which is duly noted in the police blotter, but not acted upon. Only an alert reporter from the Vancouver Columbian catches the brief note and looks up the family. This reporter and several Sasquatch investigators canvass the surroundings and neighbors and come up with a few additional items. Two sets of footprints are found, 12 inches long and 6 inches long, whereupon Brenda puts a roast chicken into a high tree fork since she wants to see the baby. An adjacent unused meadow has a large depressed area of grass in it. A patch of thimbleberries is found on the steep hillside to have been stripped of its nuts and leaves, leaving bare canes behind. The adjacent farmer's cows, which had been turned loose for the summer into a higher, lush meadow, came rushing back to the barn that night, something the farmer has never observed before. After about a week, little John comments casually, the little monkey isn't coming to play anymore. A Sasquatch was seen above a nearby lumber mill about four years earlier. Nick had been sleeping on the screen porch of the house, and he heard noises, rustling brush, and slapping footsteps on the street during the night. Similar sounds were heard by the overnighting Sasquatch investigators after the sighting. Earlier in the same year, while a Little League baseball game was in progress at the Yakult Ballpark, a Sasquatch stepped out of the forest in full view of the spectators in the bleachers and briefly viewed the game in progress before retreating into the forest. A neighbor and his daughter saw the Sasquatch on an evening after Nick and Brenda's sighting, but refused to talk about it to investigators. A couple of investigators from Seattle arrived and proceeded to establish a camp in the early evening on the steep hillside where the Thimbleberry Patch had been found. After several hours, around 11 p.m., they came racing down the hillside, dragging their unfolded tent and sleeping bags behind in disarray, got into their VW van, and left without further comment, never to be heard from again. On August 15, 2003, I was delivering my papers, and I thought I saw someone run across the road while I was delivering the papers. I often stopped to use the restroom in the same spot. I heard funny noises, but thought it was a bear or some other animal grunting and whatnot. But that night, about 4.30 a.m. actually, I was stopped along the road looking over my root sheet, when out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone walking. I slowly reached up and turned off the light. I put the car in gear and looked over. What I saw made the hair stand on the back of my neck, and I got tears in my eyes. It wasn't seven feet tall, more like six feet or so, I'm guessing, because it didn't seem to be bending over too far to look at me. It was maybe five or six feet away from the car. I was so frightened that I drove off as fast as I could. I called 911, and they thought I was a nut, and said it was most likely a vagrant or a homeless guy. I don't think so. I never, never believed in Bigfoot before that morning. I was the biggest skeptic out there. I have a degree in science, and I still can't believe it. To be honest with you, I don't want to go back out there, but it's my job, and I will not let it bother me. I don't think I will stop by the same area every morning from now on. Thanks for listening. I think you might find this video of interest as well. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.